everyone has an opinion on Julian Assange, I certainly do, but I don't know that it's worth me uh, offering opinions tonight. Uh, after the Four Corners piece in particular, I felt that I could offer observations rather than opinion, or rather eyewitness observations that I had that I haven't revealed before. And essentially it gravitates around a couple of enduring slurs against Julian, that he's cavalier to the uh, lives of, of people that were in his documents, and that he had a different level of professionalism than the true journalist did, that is the Guardian journalists and the New York Times journalists in 2010 when he first came to prominence. Well, I was there. I was there when he met them. I was there when they formed the bunker uh, at the Guardian, where they all gathered. The Spiegel, the Guardian, New York Times, and Julian. I'd been travelling with him. Um, a very hard man to find. I found him and stuck to him like glue. And so when he went to the bunker, I was with him. And the reason they let me into the bunker was that he was an incredibly unreliable and unorthodox man. So this is pretty much it. This is life possessions, right? This is you. This is not me. This is portable me. His idea of starting work was midnight. Their idea was starting at 9am and going home at 5. And the job I did, which allowed the Guardian to let me into their fortress, was that I would go and find Julian. They thought I was part of WikiLeaks, I think. I would find Julian and I'd bring him to the Guardian at a reasonable compromise, maybe two in the afternoon. So they let me in. I was there every moment. Every moment that Julian was there, I was there. And every moment that those journalists have since re narrated in their books, in their articles, in their Four Corners appearances, about the enormous integrity that they had and the lack of integrity that Julian had, I can say is a complete lie. And I am the witness to it. <laughs> so I'd like to just play a couple of uh, very small clips. I won't bore you with uh, uh, long clips, but it will just help you visualise the people that I'm talking about and the, and the places I'm talking about. So this is a <clears throat> story I did in 2010. <laughs> in the lead up to the Afghan War Rights, which was the first large release, and Julian was an unknown figure at this point and about to become incredibly well known. He's not flying entirely solo. For the first time in WikiLeaks history, he has pulled in some mainstream media heavyweights to collaborate in preparing material. So where are we, uh, where are we heading now? Off to the bunker in The Guardian. And what's in the bunker? What's happening in the bunker? Uh, in, in the bunker we have our team from Guardian, us, uh, the Spiegel and New York Times. So this is the bunker where we're about to go. You often hear about it, they all refer to it when they're doing interviews. Computers, but at least it and it was here that they were taking what Julian had, which was impenetrable dark their way through the material. They describe what they're doing during this three-hour slaughter. Okay, and then there's like another five killed here and there, and three here. So now look at now look at the exactly. Yeah. Just so you know, that's uh, Nick Davies. That was the, Julian's main contact at the Guardian. <coughs> Davies has made the most um, recurring and repetitive uh, statement that uh, Julian had this cavalier attitude to life. That's what I say is a lie. I was there. <coughs> if there was any cavalier attitude going on from my observations, it was the Guardian journalists. The Guardian journalists had this disdain for the impact of that material. The Guardian journalists at best had a, a type of gallows humour as to what would happen to <coughs> anyone revealed 
in these documents. And I can tell you, he often narrates, if you've read the books, he narrates a dinner that they went to where Julian said, well, if they die, they die. Now that is the only event that I wasn't at. I remember the dinner, I didn't go to the dinner. But I can contradict every other account they talk about from that room where anyone expressed any concern whatsoever about the lives of people, except for Julian Assange. Except for Julian Assange. Now that has been such a stark contrast to what's been repeated that oh, I just wanted to spend this time tonight dissecting that a little bit. I haven't done it before because it wasn't particularly relevant. Julian's been in custody on sexual assault charges. Now he's in custody on these, uh, the espionage material relating to the, the documents that these guys are working on together. So now it's highly relevant and I do want to put it on the public record. So it's suspicious. The other thing for anyone to pull these three important organisations together, really to yeah, three competitors together, and us. Um, they, at some stage, they bring in this uh, AC-130 gunship. Up in the corner, David uh, Lee. David Lee wrote the most damning book uh, about Julian. They, these guys, you might pick up on it, they were all over Julian, right? Julian had something valuable to them. They were fawning over Julian. None of this, well, yes, we're, all, we're the professionals and we re re retained our distance. There was no distance, I can promise you, between them and Julian at this point. David Lee's also, ironically or tragically, the bloke that printed the password to the original files. So when he did his book, you know, in a moment of boasting, he, in his book, he put the password to the, that opened the original files, all of them, that had been redacted, actually. The Julian had physically redacted. This clown put the password up, printed it, and it was still active. It still worked. <laughs> it still worked. That's what brought the full case of documents to the public eye, was him. So what, what they were doing in this room were taking the raw data, which I saw, you could see it on a, on a computer, but it was very difficult to, uh, to read, to, to, to filter, to understand. A bit like reading a, um, an XLL sheet or you know, something like that, like an accounting spreadsheet. The people that brought that material to life gave birth to it with the Guardian. WikiLeaks did none of that work. Julian didn't have the capacity to do the work. It was here with Guardian staff, those two, those two journalists, I think two, maybe three computer experts, they created the WikiLeaks database themselves. If Julian's in jail, they should be in jail. I mean, quite, quite literally, they should be in jail. They created this, they put it up, they put it out to the world. So what they were doing were generating uh, individual uh, reference codes for every entry in the WikiLeaks material. They gave it a, a graphical interface, a look, and they made it searchable. That was the Guardian, or entirely the Guardian. Also in the room, oh, be good. I mean, everyone is, has been generous and flexible. It's just be good. You always want to sort by civilian casualties. Sort this thing. Are we still only one? Sorry, I'm getting carried away. And these are the these are the techos coming in. So it's about a week of technical work. I mean, hundred hundred thousand dollars probably to do the type of work they did. <clears throat> and the New York Times were coming in uh, in the week that I was there, were coming in regularly on, uh, you know, on the telephone. Between them, the, between these three groups, the Spiegel, Guardian, New York Times, they were fossicking through the material as the tech guys kind of gave birth to it. 
prosecuting through, looking for stories that would be of interest uh, to them. Of course, it was apparent that you'd be risking, uh, if not the, the safety, a certain need exposing the identity of many people. There's, there's tens of thousands of documents there. <coughs> I never witnessed a conversation where anyone took that seriously. Not once. The only conversation uh, that occurred was between Nick Davies and David Lee. And it was, uh, Julian wasn't there. Julian was, hadn't arrived yet, but I was there approximately an hour before. And it occurred to Nick Davies, it occurred to Nick Davies, as they pulled up a, an article that they were in fact going to put in the newspaper, he said, um, well, we can't name this guy, right? We can't name this guy, obviously, in the newspaper. And then someone said, well, he's going to be named on the website. Davies said, some words to the effect, um, well, we'll really cop it then if you know, we're blamed for putting that name up. And the words I remember very precisely from David Lee was he gazed across the room at, at, uh, at Davies and said, but we're not publishing it. So, what he's in effect saying, they're going to let Julian be the, the full guy. They're going to create this, they're going to give it, make it searchable, they're going to give it a, a, a graphic uh, look, they're going to release it, they're then going to share the link to it and put, you know, 13 pages of newsprint dedicated to say, go and look at it, and they'll say, well, but we didn't publish it. Julian published it. Now, this was highly alarming to me, and I did raise it with Julian, who has, uh, amongst his other qualities, he might be a genius, but he does have a certain naivety about him uh, in reading people, in, in my view. He, he thought these guys were great. They were being nice to him. They were all absolutely, this was a collective effort. There's no, no idea that, you know, he was a source and they were the journalists. If you watch this story, you'll get a better feel of that, right? They were all in it together. And Julian didn't quite, quite believe that they'd be pushing him out onto the plank and then saying, oh, it's not us. We're just reporters. We're just reporters. I mean, shameful, shameful, embarrassingly, it's shameful. As I've never seen, I'd like to show you along those lines. This is about uh, four days before the release of the Afghan Warlocks. And remember, Afghan Warlocks was really the, the public uh, announcement of Julian Assange and, and Wikileaks. He wasn't very known prior to this. This is a conversation that's linked to what I was talking about before, from that comment of, uh, of David Lee, oh, but we're not publishing it. We can wash our hands of this, right? And how successfully they have done that. But this was a conversation uh, Julian relates to a lecturer at London University who was a very big supporter of Julian's Gavin McBadgett. Yeah, this is Gavin McBadgett's house. As the new material starts to circulate between the three publications, the full scope of the data becomes clearer and one of the partners seems to be getting a little nervous. Um, so the latest squabble uh -huh. is not over the date, they're all happy with that, but mm -hmm. to the precise time. So anyway, the Times has come back and said they don't want to go first. Why? They're like, they want us to scoop them. Seriously? Oh, so they can claim they were reprinting somebody else's news. So, that's right. Yeah, exactly. So, so they can claim that we didn't... We, we just were reporting involved. what was we're, already there. We were just reporting on what someone else did. <laughs> that's good. So who's going first? The New York Times. I mean, once, oh. once, a, a web startup press to scoop them. Wants, wants to be wants scooped. Wants to be scooped. I mean, that's chilling to watch that now. Julian's in jail because of that subterfuge. Clearly discussed amongst themselves and not discussed with Julian. You, you can see his shocking. What, what, what are you talking about? We're, we're, we're doing this together. This is a collective effort. At, what are you talking about? You, you, don't, you want me to put it? You don't want to get it? I thought you'd be dusting to get it. You know? and, and you can just see the way he, 
in the honesty in which he narrates that story. That's why he's in prison today. That's why they're not in prison, why they should be. So, I had a discussion with Julian around these um, issues, and he went back into them <laughs> to revisit the issue of identifying people within the war logs. It was Julian Assange who brought that issue to the fore, not the Guardian, not the New York Times, because they didn't care because there was no reflection upon them. They actually didn't care what happened to the people. They couldn't give it stuff, right? But as long as there was no blow back on them, they were relaxed about it. It was Julian that brought it to a head. The release was to be on, <clears throat> on Monday, Monday morning. It was Thursday or Friday, I think it was Friday, uh, where Julian said, well, we need to pull these names out. The names that are uh, identified as uh, informants. If it's going to endanger them, we need to pull them out. Now that called their bluff. Well, not that he was bluffing, but that absolutely threw them into a panic. It meant they wouldn't get their, their publication date. He asked for it to be delayed because they weren't going to assist in this task. He said, well, I'll do it with my people, but we need time. Now, because they were, as well as being allies, Guardian, New York Times, to Spiegel, they were also uh, competitors, uh, bitter competitors, very unusual to be in the same room for them, and they didn't trust each other. So they couldn't agree that they, were, they thought there was a trick going on. They'd all got ready to print on Monday. No, we're going on Monday. So what happens, all these people that now write books about how concerned they were, they all went home on Friday afternoon, back to Essex, back to Surrey, whatever. Uh, and Julian was left with not just the task, but the moral responsibility of trying to cleanse those documents in some way, and he did. Uh, all night, all night. When I say all night, I mean from you know, 5 <coughs> p.m. till 9 a.m. the next day. We were sharing an apartment at the time. <coughs> Julian removed 10,000 uh, names by himself, not with the support team of the Guardian, etc., 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 by himself, he removed them. And then it came to Sunday night. There's, there's no particular scene to show you here, but I'm just showing to give you the flavour. This is the Frontline Club. Uh, Sunday night, the press conference is Monday morning, all the uh, press editions are being printed and ready to be released. Now, this was my favourite moment actually, so... Um, the information is now on the internet, 200,000 pages, mostly classified secret. It's the raw details of America's war in Afghanistan. It will be the beginning of a media storm that will last for days. <clears throat> now what really happened? They built this artifice that Julian was the man to walk the plank uh, for them and they'll report about a man falling off a plank, right? That was the, that was the, uh, the premise. But WikiLeaks never released it that night. So the WikiLeaks were meant to release on Sunday night. The Monday papers would report this event. He couldn't get it uh, live. So all of this evening from, it was expected to be up at about 9 p.m. It was meant to be live. It couldn't go up. And the panicked calls from the New York Times started coming in. Like hysterical calls. I could hear them. Everyone could hear them. Their prints, they're, they're, they're holding the presses, you know, hold the front page. Because it was saying this, you know, weird group WikiLeaks had released, you know, uh, had published, had put online, uh, reporting, trying to report a news event. It didn't go up. And their phone calls became more hysterical uh, through the evening up until, I forget now the time difference, of, of, if it's important, I'll try and become as precise as I can. Up until about 2 a.m., they held the presses. New York and then just had to go. Now, and then the storm 
unfolded, and you'll, you'll see it here a bit of it there, the storm unfolded, that they were essentially printing a lie. WikiLeaks didn't publish that night, and in fact didn't publish the next day. I think it was about two days. I don't know if that's ever, ever known, but I think it was about two days before it got up. So these high priests of journalistic ethics were all of them very happily colluding and publishing a lie, that they were reporting something that in fact didn't happen and they knew it hadn't happened, and they'd set Julian up from the, uh, from the start. I think it's important, I think that distinction is important when you see this recurring slur, this slander against Julian that started in 2010. This, he's cavalier with uh, people's lives and he has no ethics, started in 2010. I would have well and truly thought it would have washed away uh, by now, but to see it uh, on four corners again, nine years later, in great detail, I feel compelled at least to address those issues. So I won't take any more uh, time. I'm grateful to have uh, done that. Yeah.